perhaps people were to start to think about what their future lives want to look like. Uh, it, and one of the elements of that would be to go much greener. The COVID crisis is obviously the biggest thing in everybody's life right now. But we can also take a step backwards and ask ourselves, well, where did this crisis actually come from? And one of the interesting things is that there's a lot of material appearing right now that demonstrates that it is, in fact, this, this crisis is actually a consequence of environmental degradation and, to some extent, climate change. In June, we start the hurricane season in the Caribbean. What's going to happen if you get a heavier, and this is what's thought to happen, a heavier hurricane season this year on top of what we've already got? And so we do need to be aware of the fact that climate can impinge on what's going on already directly. I think in the long term, what is the best way to recover economically from a disaster like this, from the pandemic, but also the economic consequences of the pandemic? I think one element of that is that the banks like the Inter-American Development Bank are going to be very, very important. Uh, there are a lot of countries now whose credit ratings are actually sliding simply because it's going to be very difficult for them to find the fiscal arrangements to be able to cover some of the debts that they already have. The second element is that one of the directions that we can probably go in is actually more of a green direction. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to be working on and have already begun to work on is to think about, okay, well, what kinds of recovery packages could be developed in the future? And part of those recovery packages probably will include concepts like sustainable infrastructure and green investments for the future. The bank supports uh, climate actions in countries in, let's say, four main ways. The first way is that we work directly with the governments and we help to strengthen the institutional arrangements uh, for the governments to be able to act. So uh, that's one main area that we work in. The second area is that we, if, if you don't have the financing to be able to act, then you really are not going to be able to act at all. So we help connect the donors directly to uh, countries, but we also go beyond that and create financing systems. The third area is that in our own operations as a bank, we actually incorporate climate into those operations. That directly helps the countries, but it also helps the countries learn what are the ways in which you can work in particular kinds of sectors. The fourth area is that we, we basically produce and deliver knowledge uh, that is critical. So new knowledge that can help people move forward. Just to give you some examples of that. So for institutional arrangements, for example, we're working with countries to develop long-term strategies which are the strategies that are required to be able to get to net zero by 2050. It's part of the Paris Agreement. And if you have those strategies, it's much, strategies, it's much easier to design your what are called nationally determined contributions and then to decide which operations you really want to move forward with at the end of the day. We're also improving, as we do that kind of work, we're improving the quality and the ambition the, the content of the nationally determined contributions. The final way that we're helping is actually to help people understand what's called the just transition. So if we're going to make these changes in countries uh, to, to basically reach the Paris Agreement goals, then what's going to happen is that you're going to have some people that lose and some people that win. And one of the things we've been trying to do is to identify who those groups of people are and then work with those groups of people so that the, the the impact on them is minimized uh, and in fact they can potentially benefit from this. An example of that would be for coal miners in Chile, for example, if, the, if we're going to shift to renewable energies then coal is obviously going to go out of the system. For example, if, if governments want to actually develop what are called red programs, red plus programs, which are in, in essence, how do you generate financing from reducing emissions from forest degradation and forest loss at the end of the day? Often the lands on which those forests sit belong to indigenous people. In many, most of Latin America, that is the case. A very large percentage of those lands are, are are the, the owners are in fact indigenous people. They have to be involved in any of those discussions very, very early on. And that's part of the programs that we do with the Forest Carbon Partnership Facilities to actually do those initial consultations and actually involve people very early on in that process and then actually do an evaluation of what are the impacts going to be on those people over the long term. So that's another example where people 
civil society representing people needs to be fully involved in these discussions. There are other elements of civil society that are also particularly important, I think. Um, uh, and I mentioned earlier, one of the, the projects that we've been working on is how do you get academia, for example, involved more effectively in the decision making of governments. One way to do that is to build a capacity. And this is the, sort of the example that we have of doing that is we provide the financing and the opportunity, the training and the linking and the networking for uh, universities in Latin America to be able to connect to universities all through the world to be able to do what, what, what is at the end of the day complex modeling for plans that will result in decarbonization in the long term. In many countries, there are very strong uh, non-government organizations that have a lot of communications capacity. And often it's that communications capacity that's critical. As an example of that, there's a very good non-government organization in Costa Rica that is going to be doing a lot of the communication about what are the implications for long-term decarbonization in Costa Rica? What does it mean for the person on the street? I think that Costa Rica provides a classic example of all of these complexities that are happening right now. And I think particularly in Costa Rica, uh, obviously the government role is critical, but I think civil society's role in actually delivering those changes and making sure that those that are left behind or those that are losers in this are become winners at the end of the day.